question. Oh, we're live. Oh, oh we're live. The question where you asked the question live, baby girl. All right, then you ask me the questions. You're the interviewer. Uh, what is shaken? It is the Golden Mike live episode eighty four with your boy Mark Cordone. Um, we have ah. Oh, uh, we have my buddy. Uh, we connected really, really well. Gina Lorio Dashback. Um, you're doing a you're doing a story on me, but like we were like buddies after that. Um, creator of Ink Credibility uh, Magazine. We're going to talk a little bit more about that. But more importantly, for those of you who have ever felt um, failure and growth and unexpected discoveries and all of those things mixed together at the same time. They don't usually happen separately. They usually happen all at the same time. That's what we're gonna be talking about today. So if you feel like you're in the middle of a failure, you feel like you're in the middle of a growth spurt, or there's something out there and you know you need to discover it, you know you're at the edge of discovery, that's what G uh, Gina and I are gonna talk about today. Good to see you. it's a Tuesday. Again, it's your boy, Mark Cordone. If you have not met me, I am the founder of Make Money Coaching and the new Joy Revolution we just launched. Um, so happy about that. But more importantly, I am a positive psychology coach, which means this. Very simply put two questions. Question number one, on a scale of one to 10, how happy do you feel today? Just with the feels. How happy do you feel today? And then in terms of your purpose, on a scale of one to 10, how much are you living in your purpose? So Gina, Lori, Loria, Dashback, I've got the same question for you. Are you feeling good and living in your full purpose today? Finally, yeah. <laughs> finally? Yes. We're gonna get into that finally in a little bit, huh? Yes. Okay, cool. So I see y'all there. I see a Sarah. I see a Fiona. Um, I see a Yuri, Tanae. For all of the those of you watching, feeling good and living in your full purpose. Gina, give me give me a heart right now. How does your heart beat? <laughs> I want to see you guys hit those hearts. Hit those hearts. Let me know that you're living in full purpose. Let me know that you're living life, Sarah. Good to see you. I'm, I am not wearing anything today, so a wave. <laughs> wave back to Sarah. Good to see you, Sarah. Now, here's the other thing, y'all. A lot of people think that positive psychology is about like shits and giggles 24-7. They think that it's about Taco Tuesday every single day, Skittles raining from the sky, um, and it isn't. There's a lot. By the way, there's a lot of people feeling it today. Renee, Toby giving us some hearts. Thank you so much. But a lot of people feel like uh, happiness work and positive psychology is just about the happiness work. Now, the thing is, is that if you feel happy 24-7, there's only one of two things that you are. Number one, you're a psychopath. Or number two, you're dead. Life is, around, uh, is about the ups and downs and all arounds of life, baby. And that's what positive psychology is. It's embracing those failures. It's embracing that growing pain. It's embracing these sort of new discoveries that you're having. So if you're feeling today like, oh my gosh, Cordo, oh my God, Dashback. Like last week I was feeling amazing. I was like at a 10 and like, I don't know what's going on. I feel like shit this week. I don't know why, I'm just not happy. I'm not at a 10. That's cool. That is cool. That's part of your, Un undiscovered self, right? But then the other part is if you're sitting there and you're like, yo, for 30 years I worked in corporate and like, I love this, this fulfilled me, this was my mission. And now all of a sudden it just feels off. That's cool too. Your heart beats just like Gina and mine. Uh, keep doing your thing. Keep going on your hero's journey. This is a part of your story. Keep pushing through. Just give us a thumbs up. Let us know that you're living life. And we're just here to entertain today. We're just here to entertain and have a good time. Now, here's the last piece. This is why I do what I do as a positive psychologist. And it's about hope. It is about the, the idea that whether you're a one or you're a 10, 
you feel optimistic about tomorrow, no matter how shitty or how amazing today is. You just feel like tomorrow is going to be even better based on the things that you're learning from today. So Gina, everybody watching live and on the replay, there is another button down there and it's called the wow face. If you're feeling optimistic, I want you to hit the wow face. Gina, I want you to show us the wow face. Let's do it together. One, two, three. Ah! <laughs> I love it. I love it. Sarah, thank you for being uh, I'm honest with you, with us, working on it, living in full purpose. Awesome, Sarah. And it's awesome to see you too. Uh, thanks for coming in on Tuesday. Here we go. Oh, Sarah just dropped a wow face on us. So Gina, with all of that said, all of that said, what is your story, mama? Wow. So much of what you said totally resonated with me, especially the part <laughs> about, um, working in corporate. So, you know, that was the path that I was on and I spent 20 years honing my craft doing marketing and I worked for a big tech company and, you know, kind of rose in that position and managed a great team. I always loved the people that I worked with and I felt confident in what I was doing for this company. Uh, and I wrote my neat little uh, maternity plan and I went home to have my baby. Well, I went to the hospital actually to have my baby. And then I had my baby and I was, and I interviewed one nanny and I was like, what am I doing? Like, I don't want to pay somebody to do that job. I want to do that job. And mm, so, mm, mm. um, so I, my husband and I, you know, we met with our financial person and we made the decision that I would stay home. And I, and it was the first time that I really felt this kind of sole purpose feeling. Like I was like, oh, this is what it's all about. It felt um, so good. Um, now when you were, felt, yeah. Oh, sorry, but now when you were, when now when you were younger, did you have those sort of dreams that you would be living in your, your, your full purpose? And, and what did those look like? Well, like when you were, when you were baby Gina, yeah. when you were baby Gina. Yeah. Baby. Just little Gina. You know, what were what was it that you were thinking about? So interestingly, just the other day, I wrote a post that just fell out of me. You know, I was writing something else, and then and then all of a sudden, this thing fell out. So when I was baby Gina, really up until I was in seventh grade. So what is that? Twelve, maybe, right? Twelve or uh -huh. twelve or thirteen. Mm -hmm. uh, I was an artist, and if somebody asked really? me what I was, I would have told you I was an artist. But in seventh grade you start getting some pretty significant grading that happens on your artistry. And mm. I'm pretty sure I might've gotten something like a B minus, which probably felt like an F to me. And, yeah. um, and I remember it feeling awful. I do, I really have that memory. And then when I went to high school, I went to a, a Catholic high school where if you were on the college prep track, you um, took college prep classes. And so I didn't take an art, any art classes for four years. But at the end of that, and you know, they did all those little, um, those, those uh, tests to kind of see what you're going to be when you grow up. And mine always- Yeah, I got to hear what yours was. Mine came out as um, artist and graphic designer. Wonderful. So I found this local art school because I didn't want to go too far away from home. I went to this local art school to meet with the admissions person. And she said, I'd like to see your, um, we do a portfolio review. And I said, well, you know, I, I don't have a portfolio. I haven't made art for- four or five years. And she said, well, you can't apply to an art school without a portfolio. And so then it was solidified. I was like, oh, because I'm not an artist. That's why I don't have a portfolio. Artists have portfolios. And so I so went to school. So it was like the external world kind of telling you that you weren't an artist versus, and then at that point kind of suppressing that artist. So I found my artistry through not being a graphic designer, but becoming a marketing director and surrounding myself with those people. So I ran a team. I had multiple graphic designers that worked with me. I drew little, little pictures of things that I wanted to be ads and I gave them to my graphic designers and they drew them. I made little mock-ups of little booklets or little catalogs and I would you know, tell them what I wanted in it but I had somebody else do the artwork for me. And I became an art director, although I was always resistant to use that title because I wasn't an artist. 
So I was oh. really marketing director. I break my heart. It's in deep. It's oh, in God. deep, Gina. It's in deep. So last year, I think it was last year, you know, I made my New Year's resolutions and I said, I am going to be creative. The fact is, I've always been creative, but I declared it and I started taking art classes. And so I'm back to painting and um, anything that I can do to. And so now ask me, go ahead, say, Gina, are you an artist? Gina. Are you an artist? Yes, I'm an artist. <laughs> I'm an artist, and I have an artist soul, and I'm an artist. I'm also a kick-ass marketing director and graphic designer that doesn't really know the programs, but um, but yeah, <laughs> I'm an artist. It just took me so long to get there and to say it, and it's still sometimes hard to say it. Sometimes we were at an art show this weekend, and I was talking to an artist, and the woman said, and I had my 11-year-old daughter with me, and the woman said, I was asking her some questions about her work, and she said, are you an artist? And I hesitated, and my 11-year-old daughter had to answer for me, and she said, yes, she's an artist. Mom, you're an artist. That's yeah. freaking awesome. Now, um, um, it, was the 11, is your 11-year-old daughter the one that, that really pulled you out of corporate? Is she the one? She, yes, yes. With okay. radio, she pulled me right out. Yeah. She pulled you right out, right? Yeah. So, yeah. so between her being born and you realizing, like, whoa, I'm finding a greater purpose here in wanting to be here with 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 my daughter and and raising her. When was it that the sort of calling to become an artist again came into play, or was it just always there? Were you always like? Oh, I forgot about it. Totally. You did. Okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, so, yeah. so how did that kind of reemerge in your life in, yeah. in the 11 years since she was born? Right. So it was probably four years ago where she was needing me a little bit less. And I have a son who's seven. So, you know, they were, you know, I had those school hours, right? What yeah. is it? Six hours or something. And yeah. so I wanted to make sure that my daughter and my son saw a working mom, but I really didn't want to drive to that box again. And I didn't want to give so much of my soul away. I remember missing ultrasounds. I missed wedding dress fittings, like, cause I just gave it all. Cause that's what I do. But I was giving it all to the wrong place really. Mm. So, you know, it was like four years ago. I was like, how do I take this 20 years of marketing expertise and turn it into something? So I went so, down that, uh, that path of like trying to figure out like what specifically, cause marketing is pretty broad. Right. Yeah. So I had to really keep digging down and drilling down and peeling away the layers to figure out, you know, what specifically I wanted to do and who specifically I wanted to do it for. So, so you never had this moment when you were in corporate where you were like, like this, this is totally, totally... I hear, I'm hearing feedback now. Okay. never mind. Um, so you, you never heard this moment and had this moment in corporate where you were like, I am totally being soul sucked right now. Like I hate everything about it. I'm showing up like, like, you know how you hear these stories mm -hmm. of it's just wake up, grind, wake up, grind. And that's all it is. And the person doesn't know how to get off the treadmill. It doesn't sound like no, that was that going on for me. you. No, that yeah. wasn't, that w but it became so clear afterwards. As soon as I was home with that baby, I was like, whoa, what was I doing? I think I was running as fast as I can. I think I was always trying to prove myself and I was trying to be the best boss that I could to the people that were, you know, counting on me and I was trying to be the best employee I could. And so, and here's a little secret. I didn't have, um, I didn't have my bachelor's degree. So I was hiring all of these people that had more education than me. And I was always afraid something was going to catch up when somebody was going to tap me on the shoulder and go, you're not supposed to, you ever hear imposter syndrome? Yeah. I was going to yeah. ask, did so, you feel it? Yeah. So now it's like, I wasn't really a graphic designer. I certainly wasn't an artist. And all I had was 20 years of marketing experience. Right. And years. even with the 20 years of experience, right. that I was, tiny little fucking piece of paper oh my drives God. you nuts. Right? I did go back and get it. I was 40. Have I used it? Does it matter? No, but I, I'm glad I got it. It's um, a nice placeholder on the wall. <laughs> it's a placeholder, but that's not, that didn't, that wasn't my true purpose either. Well, you know what? I think what's really interesting, Gina, is that, um, you know, I don't know if anyone is relating here, but like, oh man, I started my business over two years ago. And like, you get so stuck in the grind, like do, 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 constantly doing, right? Mm -hmm. um, this was the first weekend that I took three days off and 
basically a lock was put on my laptop box, you know, my <laughs> laptop bag, and I couldn't open it, right? So I couldn't do that much work. And I must say that the first like three hours were completely unnerving. Like it was like, I need to be doing something. I, mm -hmm. I need to be doing something. I need to be doing something. And then like, I, I, I got a, you know, I got a massage. I was like, forget that. I was over. I was like, <laughs> you know, I can relax now. But like, it, it's, it's almost as if you don't need to be living your life with that much. Like a lot of people stress the hustle and stuff like that, but you don't need to be doing it that much you don't need to be pushing yourself that hard right. um and and maybe if the we could all be saying maybe or all this stuff but like there's a way to do it where your 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 inner greatness is coming out and you just it's chill it's so much more chill it's so much easier than going against the grain and feeling like an imposter feeling like you always need to be doing um yeah. so i i am curious about this like so we've gone full circle and I want to talk about this magazine with you in a <laughs> second. But um um I would I I would uh, I'm going to make the assumption fuck it, you know. I'm going to make the assumption that that artist has always been a, a part of your true purpose within you, right? And so like how do you in telling your story or or in working with others, like do you think like a do most of us live from point A to point B? Meaning, do most most of us just actualize our purpose and then just go in a straight line towards it? Yeah, I did. <laughs> You're like, you know, worst no, I think you I, never scored out. I think that um, I think a little while. I think for a little while, you know, I I was kind of going this straight line, but I wasn't really getting anywhere. You know, it was mm. pretty stagnant. I was learning things along the way for my business, for the companies that I worked for, but I don't think I was growing. So to me, my, I, I felt like my growth was sort of stunted between some really great periods of my life. Like in my twenties mm -hmm. and thirties, I feel like I was kind of just on this track doing the same thing. So it was a grind. I just didn't really recognize it. I just thought that's, that's what it the was. It is. Yeah. yeah. And so then I had my daughter and I, you know, finished my degree and then I was 40 and, um, and then I feel like I was sort of restarted. And so when yeah. I restarted, you know, my, so then I was like, all right, I'm a marketing consultant. I got a card that says so it must be true. And, um, and so then I started trying to find work and even, <laughs> and even that I was like, what do I want to do? Like make a logo for a dentist, make a website for a nursery. <laughs> Can you draw me a tooth? <laughs> I was like, this, this isn't it either. Like that's, that's not fun. And um, so I just kept drilling down and drilling down. And and what I really wanted to do, I was afraid at first was not something anybody was looking for. And um, mm -hmm. and that is this very strange and very specific thing of creating magazines. So let me tell you a little mm -hmm. bit about how that happened. Before I worked for tech companies, I worked for my dad's business, which was pretty cool. You would have liked it. He built hot rods 1923 yeah, to 1934 hot rods and i was like a kid i was like 19 because i didn't go away to school i worked for my dad and started doing um marketing for him and he i was out in california meeting with the people from hot rod magazine and learning how to get our stories into magazines and i realized that editor's job and i know you know chris winfield he would definitely mm -hmm. agree that you know an editor's job is to get something on every page <laughs> right? That's the first job. You got to get ink on every page. And so mm -hmm. I learned how to pitch a story, kind of come up with a story angle. And then the other thing was provide really good photos. So I had a pretty good um, success rate. And also my dad built these pretty bitching cars. So it was pretty easy to yeah. get the stories told, but really loved what would happen after our stories got put in magazines. We would run ads all the time but our ad might run after somebody's really awesome article. So usually the person who had the article written about their cool car, they would get the phone calls. And the person with the ad, maybe they got the mm -hmm. phone call, but it was the articles that made the phone ring. So I started working on getting our stories told. And I took that with me when I went and worked for a technology company. And I would work with our customers who had installed their audio video technology. We used to do these presentation rooms, like when you were in, uh, probably yeah. when you were a professor, you know, you'd work with yep, the different absolutely. technology. 
So that was the kind of company that I worked for. Like smart classrooms and exactly. stuff. But instead of telling the story about this technology, we would tell a story about the kids in the classroom that were learning and how they were learning. Those stories got told. So I realized that when you tell that story of the outcome and how somebody's life has changed because of a product or a service, um, those are the stories people connect with. And those are the stories when people hear those stories, when an audience hears those stories, they take action. Oh, I got kids that I want to have my kids learn better, or I've always wanted to build a car to drive cross country, or I've always wanted to learn to be an expert speaker, whatever it yeah. is, right? So these are the stories that people resonated with. So then I tried to write case studies. I'm going to be a writer. I'm just going to write case studies. And I realized that my clients didn't know what to do with the stories. Eh, some of them would put them on their website, but you know, it wasn't, um, it wasn't, still wasn't clicking for me. So then right. I came back to this idea of what if I gave people their own O magazine with their favorite things and with their inspirational stories and with stories of their um, of their clients who now live um, better lives because of their services. And I thought, right. is this a thing? I'm going to make it a thing. So now it's a thing. And so I launched uh, Peruse, the magazine creator. Um, to uh, to help people do that. That's freaking that's freaking awesome. Um, and I'm also thinking about like this is so random, but like um, I think I th we're around the same age. I don't know if you were punk rock, but we're around <laughs> the same age. But like I don't know if, if you uh, probably more crew. Adam Ant than punk rock. I was like, okay, Adam Ant. Adam Ant is pretty on the edge. pretty close. <laughs> it's pretty close, but like um, we would go and we would make zines. Do you remember what zines mm -hmm, were? Mm -hmm. Like we just basically kind of type up a couple articles. We'd give buttons out, stickers, mm -hmm. and then like um, um, as we're doing these things, we're trading them with our friends. We're mailing them to people across the country. People are subscribing. Then like you send it to the record company. They'll send you some more free CDs. Mm -hmm. Like it was part of this just, I, I wouldn't say underground, but it was just, part of something that was that was done and there's I, I i don't know about you but like there's some still something about touching the paper you know yeah. there's something about touching the paper or receiving it, it yeah it's not it's not there's something it's a thing it's called oh, tell me about it yeah it's called haptics h a p t i c s haptics is the thing when you touch your cell phone you know the home button on your cell phone and it has that little pulsate feeling and you're like oh something just happened so that's haptics as it relates to technology but there's also haptics that happens with paper and so it's that feeling of you know of oh i remember something is on the right hand page you kind of have that thing like you flip through it it yeah, makes a little tick, tick, tick noise, tick, tick, tick. Yeah, tick, right. You know, and so that very real sensation. If you have, I mean, and I don't do this yet, or I haven't done this yet on my magazines. But if you have that special finish, if you ever seen Fast Company magazine, it has a um a very tactile feel to it. It's almost sandy. I don't love it, but it's kind of their own thing. Yeah. Sometimes, um, it sticks out to me. Majid's business card has that uh, a velvety sort of feel. I have it. never even thought about it. Yeah, you know, it has that little snap to it. That's all a very real thing. And sometimes when you hand somebody your business card, you know, they kind of go, "Oh, nice card." And so it can be completely disruptive. It's disruptive, like, and to, it's a get... it's an actual sensory thing that they've done like stu brain studies where there's just like this little area of your brain that little lights up and goes, "Oh." This is a this is a thing. And then guess what happens with memory and recall? Just like you go, oh, I know that note is on the upper right hand corner. I remember it, scribbling something there, right? And you I'm sure it boosts it. Yeah, yeah. So the recall is like 64% recall. When oh, somebody reads wow. something in print, they're like, oh yeah, I remember reading about that guy with the red hair with the microphone. What was that guy? What? And then they go, oh, and I remember where I left the magazine. How do you get back to the website page, right? Who knows where that is? But you go, oh, yeah, that magazine, it's on the corner of the, you know, coffee table or it's in the bathroom, like you remember. So there's that this. Makes so much sense. Now, I wanted, cool. to throw, I wanted to throw this out. We're, we'll come back to the. I know, I didn't mean to go off stuff. in that direction. No, no, not at all, not at all. But um, one of the things that I've heard is, is that if you want to increase the way that you. Uh, or the impact that you communicate with somebody, 
Well, the lowest level you can do is email them, right? right? The next highest level is to leave them a voicemail. Um, um, but then as you start moving further and further up, um, I think it's either one or two is to write them a note. Mm-hmm. Is that the same thing? Is that the, is, is well, that- I think it, I, you know, I know they always talk about, and it, it ranges from seven to 12 times. I always hear like somebody has to see your message seven to 12 times before they the rule of touch. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, I think when somebody hears your voice, and then sees your face is definitely where something happens. So I think a magazine might come a little bit before that. You know, the yeah. thing that's special about the magazine is, you know, it's a pretty, the world that we're in right now is a pretty even playing field as far as create, create the thing that makes you collect the email address so that you can send the email so that you can, you know, post Funnels. on your social media, right? We Funnels. all have, yes, we have that yeah. same, that's an even playing field. Yeah. But in order to have um, a magazine, you got to have the stories to tell. You have to have sure. the outcomes and you can do those outcomes like this. You can, you know, you can have a, you know, Facebook lives, you can have, you know, you can create videos, um, so a magazine in that case, a magazine is just another way to tell that story. But again, you know, the magazine, the print magazine part has the, the recall that is sort of the special, the special. Gotcha. Go gotcha. And it's funny because our girl, Sarah just said, I just bought something after seeing it about seven times. <laughs> yeah. So like it's, it, it really is, it, it really is, a. Uh, and, yeah, you know, a rule, but something and that, that rule has not changed. So I've been doing marketing now for. 30 years. And uh, that rule has never, hasn't changed. They always said that like, you know, seven times your message had to be seen, but now we have all these other ways. And some of those ways are, you know, pretty low cost, you know, getting your message out on Facebook and creating podcasts and creating lives. Like those are some pretty great ways that we have that everybody has access to now. But now we're like, so how do you get the next level? How do you stand out if everybody has access to the same stuff? You know, and I'm standing in my expertise and I have these outcomes. How do I make my stuff stand out against the guy in the coffee shop that doesn't have all that yet? But he's got the funnel. So money. You know, that is that is so money. Um, Well, you're definitely talking about some of the things that like when it comes to strategy, like what is what's some of my strategies for success? Mm -hmm. Um, There's had to have been moments along the way where you've experienced some, you know, ostensible failures. Like, can you tell us, can you talk to us about that? And can you talk to us about like your take on that? Yeah. Well, you know, we know, we, we know they, people say it to you when they, when they try to console you, like you'll learn from the road to success is paved with failures. And <laughs> at that moment, you're like, screw you. Like this hurts really bad. Like it that hurt. Like eventually, though, you kind of go, "Yep, I learned from that one." Um, you know, I had one recently when I was when I was launching and building this magazine service that I actually now call a magazine product because mm-hmm. I started out trying to do it as a service, and I know because I've been doing it for thirty years. I, I've produced literature and catalogs and magazines and i know about the the visual impact and i know about the organizational you know flow i know how to do this but i was not standing in my zone of genius and i was not standing in the power of my own company and running my company my way i think i was still I think I was still that marketing director at that $10 million company that had lots of levels of management telling me how to do things. And so one of my first experiences um, was for, I won't say a name, but it was a kind of somebody prominent in your industry of coaching. Mm -hmm. And I wanted nothing more, nothing more than to please this person and to make a really big splash uh, by producing a magazine for her that was really dynamite and I had the vision for it and I knew I could do it. And then came what any graphic designer would call the stuffing 10 pounds of shit in a five pound bag. 
And, oh. I, and I let her keep saying, and I want this in, and I want this in, and let's do this, and let's feature that, and let's feature this. And I'm like, I'm out of pages, and it's yeah. we're out of the contract, and it doesn't, and I tried everything to make this person really happy, Blah. and it just fell apart like a month before we were ready to go to print. Like we just, and so it felt bad on so many levels from a money okay. standpoint, from a where I wanted to launch my business standpoint. Uh, and then I rose like the phoenix from the ashes and I feel better. I do. Okay. I felt really bad, but I, I remodeled how I would do my business. I came up with, with my incredibility model, which we'll talk about, um, yeah. which is why, um, you know, so now it's, I know how to do this successfully and I know how to, um, you know, kind of run, run it my way so that my clients will be successful. And I didn't let that happen. That so, so you know. Gina, I want to ask you about this. I think everybody in here can relate to going through failure. Um, I've heard a lot in the coaching space, not standing in my greatness. What, what does that mean? <laughs> I'm like the only, I feel like I'm the only one trying to serve coaches. That's not a coach. I'm not a coach. Yeah. Coaches. I'm like a civilian. Um, not standing in your greatness is, you know, not, um, you know, I, not, not being in your, your calling. Like I know what my true purpose is not coming from my true purpose. And, um, and there's still parts of running my business that I'm gonna have to do that are not my true purpose. Some of it that I could hire out, but some of it that I just need to work really hard at and know that that's the stuff I'm gonna have to work hard at. I'm gonna have to slay those dragons. Those are the ones, you know, creating a magazine comes easy for me, but doing the accounting and doing the managing expectations of difficult clients. So now I have to make yeah. sure I'm fully in alignment with somebody that I work with which I didn't see okay. that before. Before I was just like, yeah, anybody that wants to give me money, I'll make them a magazine. Now I'm like, yeah, no, huge, I don't want to work huge. for just anybody. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, because I just wanted to throw it out there because I think I've heard it enough times where I was like, what the fuck does that mean, man? Yeah. <laughs> so I didn't mean to I didn't mean to call you out specifically, but from what I'm hearing is that there's, you know, when you recognize that um, there's this sort of capacity that you have to bring it, or this, this, uh, you know, this, uh, this ideal self that you can be, and you're not living it. You're not standing in your greatness. That's what I'm hearing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That totally, that totally makes sense. And I mean, I, I think now that you've brought that up, I think about the fact that um, there's plenty of times where I struggle with that. You know, like I'm like, oh man, I know, I know, I could have said this, but for some reason, I held back on it. Mm. You know, I held back on it either because of repercussions or just old ways that I think that people would react to things. And, you know, I went to Catholic school, too, so I'm going to go to hell. <laughs> yeah, you know. We're you know, all going to be there. We'll all be all there. Well, I'm having a leadership position there. So, <laughs> but um, so so, yeah. So I the big thing that I got from from failure is that, you know, um, you were talking about it. People are going to try to console you. But. It, it is important for you to feel the feels. Then it's important for you to um, allow yourself to grow from that. Yeah. Right. Um, so I, I said this at the very beginning, unexpected discoveries. Um, that's something that's that's super important to you. And tell us why that is important to you. These unexpected discoveries that we make in our lives. Um, why is it important to me? Well, no. I mean, a lot of times, you know, you you kind of you think you know how you're going to get there, and uh -huh. and your path takes you in some different directions. You know, I have been um, honing, you know, my skills as a leader, and I think in my mind I had this idea of what leadership was, and in building my business, I knew I wanted to be a leader in my business, but I was sort of struggling of what that meant to be to me you know my last mm -hmm. name might sound my last name might sound familiar to some of your um you know some of your audience so my sister angela loria is a is a leader and a disruptor and a the biggest badass that i know in creating um uh creating authors and and helping all these people publish books and you know as a middle child 
there's a little bit of this comparison thing that happens. And what am I, what if I'm not You're like the middle her? child? Oh God. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Total jam. Yeah. And so I was like, what if I'm not that kind of leader? Well, first yeah. of all, nobody, and I will tell my kids this, so I got to get it in my head. Like there's nothing good that comes of comparing yourself to anybody. Right. No, the and comparison so, trap. so bad. Um, so you put that with like imposter syndrome. Like, <laughs> sometimes you got to get out of your own way. Right. Sure. Um, but what I realized in trying to build in building my business and my position, I learned that I can be a leader and be a contributor. So I don't have to be a coach. So, you know, like I mentioned before, like, I'm like, I feel like I'm the only one in the whole world is not a coach. I don't want to be a coach. Can I change the world without being a coach? And I was worried I couldn't, but I know I can. So I learned that I'm a contributor and that I'm contributing to help leaders and change makers and coaches to get their message out to the world and that that role is just as important. And so that's sort of that crooked line of getting there and the expectations of what I thought a leader was. And I was so afraid that I couldn't be a leader and be an advocate. And that mm. I can, and, and, and I know that I can, and I'm so happy that I got there probably through coaching. So I'm not a coach, but I listen to it, right? So no, I absolutely, I absolutely love that. Can I change the world without being a coach? That is such a great message. And I think um, on the other end, like I say the same thing. Like, um, can I change the world with without having to be that person on the front line? Um, you know, as a person who used to do social justice work and stuff like that, like you get tired and burned out. You know, and I've got a I've got a kid now and I've got some other goals. Right. And so can I, can I still be subversive? Can I still, um, um, uh, be revolutionary without having to be on the front line? Right. And I think that there's ways that we can to uh, we can totally do that. You can still show up and be persuasive without having to take on a specific role, uh, or get a certain credential. I love it. Yeah. And so what I happened was I was feeling sort of like, I don't even know if I'm using this word right, like meta about magazines. Like I'm like a magazine maker and talking about magazines and I wanted to create my own magazine. And I was like, can I create a magazine about magazines? I'm the only one that would be- That's interested. meta, that's <laughs> meta. <laughs> so I was like, I don't want to do a magazine about magazines. So I put that on hold for a while. And I was like- So what? you knew you wanted to make a magazine though. Yeah. That's what you wanted. I okay. knew, well, so I knew that I wanted to make a magazine for myself because- I was telling all these other people, you should have a magazine because it's going to help position your message. It's going to help you show up as the authority that you are. Uh, mm -hmm. It's going to help your audience connect with you and help you build a community. And I had a couple of people say, wow, that sounds great. Where's your magazine? And I was like, I don't, I don't have a magazine. And um, so I thought really deeply about, well, what could I make a magazine about that would help people see me as um, for the expertise that I have. So that, if you don't mind the segue into no, segue. why I created why I created my magazine, Incredibility, is I started, um, you know, and I was always like, what am I gonna be the leader in? What am I gonna be the expert in? Am I gonna be the expert in magazines? Which is nice, like, I like being the expert in magazines. But what I've really been working on and studying in the last, really, 45 days is credibility an authority, an expertise. Mm. And I took this question to a LinkedIn group and I asked just the question of, you know, who do you trust and what word resonates with you? Authority, expertise, and credibility. And it turned into one of those posts where everybody was like hitting it for like two weeks, right? Everybody's like charm charming <laughs> in. And I was like, what was that post? Like, right, you make a million posts. Like that's the one everybody like, you know, was chiming right. in on. Well, the answer was credibility. And, uh, Interesting. and, and so then I started doing more studying about well, what is, what is credibility and, um, how do, what, what does this mean to people and how do we cut, how, how do you become credible? So here's what I learned. Cause I think this is interesting. Uh, in order to, I have my little notes here cause I want to get them in the right order. So, uh, so the question is, who do you trust? And the first question, is, and so it comes down to sort of the who, what, and how, because everything, it feels like everything comes back, back to that. But mm -hmm. do they have integrity? What is their intention? So 
that's the first thing that that your audience will be looking for when they're looking for a credible resource. They want to know, does this person have integrity? What is their intention? And they want to know, can this person inspire and can this person lead us in a new direction? So those are those are those are two big parts of the who. And then they want to know, does this person have expertise? Um, and do they deliver, have they delivered results working in their expertise? So that's the what. And then the last part is, um, and this is the interesting part to me, and this is where it connects back to what I do, which is how is their message presented? And so um, very specifically, somebody who is credible presents their message in a professional and an organized way and in a visually appealing way. And there's many, magazines are clearly not the only way to do that. There's lots of ways you could yeah, do that. Absolutely. You could write a book with a really cool cover on it and without typos and grammatical you know, errors, right. you could create a, a Facebook Live video and have some nice lighting and some nice graphics. So there's all these things that you could do to build your credibility, which is how you, how you show up. In your message and those are the main things and this some of this comes back to um, science comes back to Stephen Covey if you remember that name seven mm -hmm. habits of highly effective people um, mm -hmm. and so um, so I realized it wasn't just a crapshoot of like oh how you know by the way when I wrote that when I and I had that post written and sort of crowdsourced the idea of credibility uh, some of the things people were saying is you could call yourself an expert um, anybody can call themselves an expert, but credibility is something that you have to earn. Uh, mm. Same thing with authority. Um, mm -hmm. Somebody can also give you that name. Oh, this guy is the authority on happiness, but that doesn't necessarily um, earn you credibility. The credibility mm -hmm. comes from the outcomes, the results that you get, the expertise tied into that, and again, how you how you show up. The magazine articles that are written about me. Magazine articles. That are written about me. Yeah, yeah. So I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, so when we created when we created my magazine, it just came out last week, and I think that we're gonna drop a, a link or something. Um, Absolutely, I will drop a link. So, but I worked with uh, an anthropologist. Her name is Ellen Cornett. She's amazing, and we dug deep on some of these those three sort of core things. Um, and we came up with a quiz. And so I put that quiz in the magazine. So people can um, take the quiz and kind of see how they, how they show up. And, you know, it's a no judgmenty thing. Like, you know, when I tested it with some people, they were at first like, well, I don't, I don't want it to tell me I'm not credible. But really all it's gonna do is, you know, develop more content, take a little bit more time with doing these things, establish, you know, establish more of those client testimonials. When you do good work, go yeah. back and get the, go back and get the testimonial. Like, yeah, the, absolutely. So, so some really, really great tips like that. Um, so Gina, let me ask you this, like in terms of your vision, when you want somebody to read or as someone has read this cover to cover, um, uh, incredibility, ink, credibility um, <laughs> cover to cover like what is it that you want them to walk away feeling or knowing oh, I or love acting that on question. yeah I love that question well look they can there's some really great information in there that really just will help them um, to evaluate how they're showing up seeing if there's some steps that they could be taking um, to show up a little bit differently um, some maybe non-traditional marketing waves, like we talked about, again, it's a pretty even playing field. Um, so how can you show up differently um, mm -hmm. is, is some of the things that come out of that. Uh, obviously, I offer my services and talk yeah. about that in there. Um, I have my, uh, cause I love quizzes. And so, uh, you know, anybody that's read like Cosmo or Esquire, there's always like a quiz in there, right? So I had to put a quiz in my magazine. So the quiz in the magazine is about credibility there's also a link in there um, to a quiz that's on my website to see if you are peruse ready. Peruse is my um, my magazine company, P E R O O Z M E dot com. Peruse me dot com mm -hmm. is my website, uh, and there's a quiz on there that will help you kind of inventory your marketing and your branding to see if a magazine 
might be something that's ready that's you know that's something that's aligned with you um, so that would be obviously an outcome of my magazine just like when I do a magazine for my clients the outcome is for them to take some kind of action join my course listen to my podcast download my free book become a member so there's yeah. you know every client has their own um, you know their own strategy and reason for creating the magazine having me plan and produce the magazine and that's that's part of the service that I provide is strategizing yeah. about how you would do that now, do you do things when it comes um, helping out with distribution or yeah? So we yeah yeah. So the specifics of my the specifics of my magazine um, program. So I call it the Incredibility Method, uh, mm -hmm. and it's an acronym because when I worked in the technology world, everything was a TLA three letter acronym. Mm -hmm. so mine is a four letter acronym, uh, and it's Rise. So the first okay. is to to kind of recognize that you need to rise out of the digital sameness and that playing that even playing field. The second part is to identify content that you already have. You already put your blood, sweat and tears into it and you're using it and it's producing for you, you know, in your blogs or online. So let's take that content and recraft it into a new format. So identify um, the powerful content that you already have. And the next part, S, uh, is to strategize. And this is the part where we look at, like, where are you going to show up? Are you, having, um, are you having a live event that people are going to come to? Are you speaking or part of a panel? Maybe you can send the magazines to an event planner and they can stuff them in the goodie bags. Um, are you a healthcare practitioner and you could put them in doctor's offices? Uh, I have a fibromyalgia health coach. She puts, puts them in uh, chiropractor's offices. Um, so, so there's strategize. Um, so it's either in person, maybe you want to do some mailings, do it as part of an onboarding process. Do you have a membership program and it's something mm -hmm. elite that you would give to your VIP members, maybe even featuring the VIP members. So that's the mm -hmm. S is strategize. And the last part is the experience and the engagement. So once you get your story into the hands of your audience to give them this sensory experience and a way to mindfully engage with your message, which, oh, by the way, magazines, 25 to 45 minutes of reading your message as opposed to, I mean, we've got them captivated here, right? In this captivating Facebook Live. But, you know, most of the time, you know, people are reading your message like this, right? Oh, yeah. And there's notifications Absolutely. popping up and then they're like, I don't know where I was, right? So, uh, so that's it, rise. So it's uh, rise out of the digital sameness, identify your content that is already working for you. Just keep using it, it's amazing. Strategize about how to get that out there. That's part of the services that, that I provide, either doing it for you or guiding you on how to make that a system that works for you. And then engaging with the experience, having your clients engage with the experience. So yeah, so, yeah. Rise. Well, I I feel like you're the, the perfect person to talk to right now because um, uh, one of the things it was just announced last week in the Joy Revolution. Um, it's it's a uh, it's a group that puts together positive psychology concepts and social justice concepts. Oh, so how can we like change society without like killing ourselves? Like how can we use joy as something that is an asset, right? Yeah. So actually at the end of this, um, everyone who's participating is writing about 5,000 words and we're gonna have a little magazine that we're, <laughs> we're trying to figure out how to distribute. And yeah. we're gonna do that after every single Joy Revolution. So it's gonna be like Joy Revolution 1, Joy Revolution 2. I could totally see us using the RISE method, like part of the, part of the movement is to rise above like all the digital sameness is to be walking around giving them out like old school zines. Yet yeah. you know, there's like 10, 12 of us in the group, and we're all around the world. Yeah, that's know, so awesome. be, And oh, by the way, there is a there is a digital version that that I also right do on. with my clients, and I'll I'll share with you the details on how you could how you could use that because then there's definitely all sorts of cool stuff that you can that you can do online as well. But the key is if you're gonna if people if it's face to face, people to people, how good yeah. is that? and so. That's a great way Pretty to damn. do that. <laughs> Pretty damn. Okay. Gina, 
Can, can you believe an hour just passed? Yeah, I can. Thank you. That was amazing. I mean, no, I can't, but. <laughs> oh, okay. You're like, yeah, that was boring. No, that was like, I'm like, I can keep going. <laughs> that was amazing. Thank you. Seriously, that was the fast hour. Um, I want to thank you for coming on. Um, the links are all there already in the show notes. They're already live for you to click on. I posted them during the show. Go and check out the first um, the first edition, the debut edition of Incredibility, the magazine, um, and follow Gina. I got Gina, um, uh, I, I got her contact in here. So just click on her name and you can follow her as well. Um, Gina, you need to come back. You need to tell oh, us how things amazing. are going. Yeah, you need to tell us how things are going. The people that you're you're featuring, um, don't forget about us oh, yeah. um, when this thing blows up. Um, and now this is why it's called the golden mic. I get to, I get to go back and be a coach with you for just a second. Oh, I love this. So I want you to imagine for a second that a golden mic is descending from the ceiling and stopping right in front of you now, Gina. And for two minutes or less, this golden mic translates into every language all across the world. It means the world is your audience. Mm. So Gina, when I flip the switch, you are on the golden mic live. So Gina, your golden mic is live now. Well, world, first I wanna tell you that one of the, my favorite inspiring coaches is Sally Hogshead, and I can't say it any better than her, and that is that different is better than better. I love that so much, and I think that's the most important thing to take out of it. Uh, the other thing I want to tell the world is to um, is to listen to your soul and to follow your purpose. And if you don't know your purpose, find it. Like you gotta find it, and and you always have to be looking for it, and you always have to be striving to um, to reach it, and to encourage that also in your children. So that's another thing that's really important to me is to not. Is, is to always look for it. So I always wanna encourage that with my children. I feel like it took me a long time to get there and it doesn't have to be that hard. Mm -hmm. yeah. now, Gina, I want you to take that that right hand. I want you to stay out there and drop that golden mic like it's hot, mama. Yeah, oh, drop it's so like it's hot. Gina Loria Dashback, um, founder of um, Incredibility, magazine the incredibility method rise um go and check it out guess what guys this has been 84 of the golden mic live you can't cancel me people and i'm <laughs> gonna be back again tomorrow for episode 85 it's because y'all keep showing up it's because people like gina are around their story needs to be tell told She's telling other people's stories. Do you see how meta it's starting to get? Oh, so it. I'm going to say one more question for everybody watching live or watching on the replay. And it's this. If you're feeling good and you're living to your full purpose, what is your responsibility to change history for the better? This is the Golden Mike. I'm Mark Cordone. This is your girl, Gina. We're out. I'll see you tomorrow. See you guys. Yeah!